Welcome to Humble Beginnings, the Undrafted Podcast. I'm your host, Rochelle Hamilton Jr., and this is episode 35. Episode 35 of the Undrafted Podcast. Man, this is a blessing. Uh, I didn't even know if this podcast would make it to 35 episodes when I started it. So uh, I'm just extremely blessed and extremely thankful to make it to this, I guess you could call it a milestone. And I want to thank you for rocking with me on the uh, Undrafted Podcast. It really means a lot to all my supporters and my listeners. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I got a good one for you today. We're going to talk about, um, well, before I even get into all that, we got an interview with a special guest, uh, Miss Andrea Roberson. Now, she has a book coming out called A Sister's Revenge, and I love the message behind this book. Now, this book comes from a place, uh, a very personal place. Uh, there was a family tragedy uh, that took place in her family when she was just a young girl. And it's something that uh, hits very close to home for her. And she's taking this tragedy and she's using it and turning it around in a way to spread, you know, a message of positivity and really affect positive change from one of the most unlikely places. Um, so I love her story. I love the message that she's bringing into this book. And I'm excited to have her on the podcast today. So that's going to be first up. Then I'll talk about that thriller of a game between the Steelers and the Saints that went on on Sunday night. Man, if you got a bad heart, I really hope you had 911 on speed dial because, man, that game, that was a great, great game. Then I'll talk about the Denver Broncos and what an embarrassment of a season this has been for them after they got trashed 27-14 to on Monday night against the Oakland Raiders. Then in What's the Wave with Chef Row Daddy, there are some surprising foods. We hear all the time from experts and dietitians and nutritionists about, you know, these foods that we should substitute in place of sugars and carbs and things like that. And I'll have a list of some surprising foods that actually have more carbs than a bowl of pasta. And some of them are extremely unlikely. And I'll just tell you right now, some of you prepare to have your hearts broke. Uh, and this is some bull jive, man. Baker Mayfield, Baker Mayfield is petty and he keeps he's on this petty in the street, man, that I'm just not feeling. So I got all that coming up in episode 35 of the Undrafted Podcast. Let's get it. I'm joined with Andrea Roberson, the author of a new book called A Sister's Revenge. And uh, I, hey, I, I really appreciate you taking time out with me on the Undrafted Podcast. So uh, for all my listeners, how about you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, I'm Andrea Robeson. Uh, I'm originally from Merritt Island, Florida. Um, went to school at Southeastern Illinois uh, Junior College in uh, Harrisburg, Illinois. Um, did two years there in junior college. Got a scholarship there, and I transferred to Fresno State where I played basketball for two more years. And I majored in criminology where I started my bureau career, Federal Bureau uh, Prisons in Mendota, FCI, Federal Correctional Institution Mendota. And I'm currently a recreation specialist out here at FCI Big Spring in Big Spring, Texas. Okay. Okay. You actually just answered one of my questions because I know you were <laughs> a, you were an athlete through school. So did you did you exclusively play, play basketball or did you were you involved in other sports? Well, in high school, I, uh, I ran track for a little bit, mostly like field events. Um, I didn't like running, um, <laughs> and I played <laughs> basketball. Uh, volleyball a little bit but not on a team and i play soccer uh club soccer but basketball is my main sport so okay so yep. all-around athlete I, I dig it so yes, sir. um you said you're from Merritt island florida born and raised so what when it comes to sports what teams do you ride with oh i'm a all-around florida fan i got miami heat and yes that's with or without lebron james <laughs> okay. i've always been a heat fan so no i'm not a lebron james rider okay um Miami Dolphins, Florida Florida Gators, and baseball. I don't really watch baseball, but I'll choose the Marlins if I had to. And hockey, I choose the Tampa Bay. What is it? I don't even know what their hockey team is, but <laughs> I think it's anything the li- with Florida. <laughs> I think it's the Lightning over in Tampa Bay, if I remember. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, the Lightning or something like that. Yeah, that's it. So right. anything that has to do with Florida, that's overall, that's my squad. Okay. Yeah, don't feel bad about the hockey thing because I don't know much about hockey either. I kind of just remember <laughs> the name. So, um, Absolutely. But I'll, I'll switch gears. Now, you, you got a book coming out called The Sister's Revenge, and I know it comes from a very personal place. Um, mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, A Sister's Revenge is actually a book about my brother. Uh, my little brother got shot and killed in 
1993, he was shot and killed. It was manslaughter. Uh, got shot and killed by a white dude. And basically, he was six at the time, and he was playing around. Uh, him and his friends were just being kids and, like, playing around his window. And they said the white dude accidentally shot him in the head mm. to get them st- to stop playing by the window. But we all know what's an accident and what's not an accident. So basically, he was tried 15 years but only did six years. Um, so one day I had a dream that um, he came into the prison that I worked at and I kind of got revenged on him, uh, kind of set him up with some, I don't know exactly what gang it was, but mm-hmm. I told him what happened and it was a black gang and basically they got him killed. Mm-hmm. So I had went on Facebook and, I shared my thoughts, and people was like, oh, you should write a book, and everybody's like, I remember that day, and whatnot, and I was like, Blase, and I was like, you know what, yeah, I should, so I see inmates writing books all the time, and I'm like, right, right. <laughs> if they can write a book, surely so can I, so I just started to write a book, and basically, in the beginning of my book, it talks about the incident that happened, mm-hmm. and um, I was seven at the time, so I still remembered a lot. It's right. a lot that I held in because I didn't want my mom to see me sad because I seen her sad. Right. So it's a lot that you held in at seven years old. So I just put it all in my book and just told everybody how I felt about the situation. And it's fictional and non-fictional. So I tell about the story of my little brother and like in the middle, I tell you about the revenge of how I got the dude killed and everything. So And at the end, it's like Romans 12, 9, it says, Revenge is this mind says the Lord. It's like a lesson learned. Don't get revenge on anybody. Let the Lord handle it. So it was very therapeutic for me. So that's why I wrote it. Okay, that 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 is amazing. I, I, yeah. I you know, even though it comes from a a tragedy, I, I like how you kind of, you were able to kind of turn it around into like a positive message. Um, yes, sir. But as far as like your your little brother, um, can you kind of tell me, you know, what was you know what was he like and you know, as a person and, you know, kind of some of the things that you remember him, like some of the good memories you have of him. Okay. Uh, well, my brother was very playful and cheerful. Like he was <laughs> always wanted to play if it was raining, snowing, even though it don't snow in Florida, but like he just wanted to be outside. He was never like the new generation of our kind. I always want to play video games and stuff like that, but he always was into sports. Uh, he never got to play on a uh, sporting team because he was so young so right. that that's what I missed about him because he never got to play me see him play on a team you know he could have been in the NBA or he could have been in the NFL we never know you know so right. I just remember him like love he loves sweets like he liked to eat bananas he loves cookies he was just playful he was a little bad boy too but he was <laughs> just a lot of people like to be around him because he was just like that dude like mm-hmm. he was the youngest so you know the youngest is always favorite so uh, he was, that was like my best friend, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, me and my older brother, we never really got along, right. even though I love him just like I love my younger brother, but mm-hmm. we never really got along. So me and him just kind of like tag team up on him and try to get him in trouble and everything. But <laughs> my little brother was, that was my dude. So we were so close in age. So and made us close. So yeah, he was very, very playful. And what What was your brother's name? Ahmad. Ahmad, Ahmad Thomas. Okay. Okay. Um, now, m- m- love, well, you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but, you know, most people in you and your family's, you know, situation, naturally, they would want to get revenge. I mean, that's that's just human nature. Um, mm-hmm. You would want to get revenge in the worst way on, you know, on your loved one's killers. But you've made it a point, like you were talking about in Romans twelve nine in the book, uh, to say vengeance belongs to God. How are you mm-hmm. able to really kind of reach a place of such peace, you know, given the circumstances of, of everything? You know what? Um, I had to leave. Well, I was so young when it happened. So I figured, like, it happened when I was so young. I don't even remember, like, the whole funeral part. Like, I don't even know if I put that in my book because I I don't remember everything. So it happened, like, years ago, maybe, like, what, 30 some years ago? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if it happened, like, when I was older, it's, it's it's, it's more effective. But, like, as I got older, it's like, dang, I did research. I didn't know. He only got six years. Like, I did research on it, and I looked it up, and he only got six years. My mom always told me he got 15, not knowing that in the state prison, you know, that good time gets cut off. You don't do all your years in the state prison. So right. I had to cope with it by, like, 
doing right in school because I know I was a bully. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, I was a bully in school and mostly to white people. Like I I never was racist. Right. I don't want to say I was racist. My mom wasn't racist. She didn't raise me like that because she still had white friends. And I still was cool with her white friends and everything. They used to come over mm-hmm. and I couldn't be racist. My teammates were white. My coaches was white. So I had to grow up. And right. at a young age, I, would, I just I kept getting counseling, and it really didn't help. I just did it so I wouldn't get in trouble with my mom. But mm-hmm. I felt like, what can a white lady tell me that, you know what I'm saying, her, her, her brother's still alive. What can you tell me? It's nothing I can tell you. So like, I, when I was younger, I went to this camp called Camp Hope. Okay. And it was a lot of people like myself that went through tragedies. And they, they went through the same thing I went through. So it's not like, it was like I'm not alone, you know. Wow. white black everybody was there it was activities that we did and we had counseling and stuff so after that i just got into sports and that made me do better in school because you got to get good grades to play sports so mm-hmm. i knew i didn't want to stay i knew i didn't want to stay in um Merritt island or florida period so mm-hmm. i was getting recruited by like all these florida teams and i was just like no i don't want to stay because after my brother died we stayed in the same apartments actually Okay. So, till I till I moved out, so it's like wow. my mom didn't want to leave him. So right. she asked us. She said she asked us when we were young if we wanted to leave, and she was like, we, she said we said no. So because that was like our community, that was like family, you know. So mm-hmm. we stayed there. So I just had to get away. Like I'm glad like Southeastern was recruiting me and stuff, and like not too many people were coming to our games to recruit us, you know. Right. Because we had a small team and we were we we, we started getting good. Like my junior year so a lot of coaches started to come to recruit me outside of florida so i just had to get away i didn't want to be a product of my environment like let my attitude get me in trouble and start bullying people and getting in trouble all the time so i just left okay and you were talking about your teammates now i met you through one of my good friends uh your teammate Paige diggs yes and man i've been knowing Paige. oh lord me and Paige, i think <laughs> Man, I think me and Paige almost came out of the womb knowing each other, basically, man. I mean, it's been, right. man, that, that's my <laughs> yeah, buddy like right there. <laughs> yeah, it's like a sister to me. Oh, yeah, Paige is good people. She's really, really good people. Yes, yeah, she is. Um, now, since I've known you and, you know, met you through Paige and everything, you made it a point to basically want to bring about positive change from inside the prison system. I guess with that, with you wanting to have positive change inside the prison system, kind of tell me your thought process uh, with that. Okay, so we, we, I'm dealing with adults here, male adults. So I used to work with juveniles, and I always wanted to make a change. And it's hard when kids, they they are, they, I mean, I'm going to say hard, but they sometimes they're hard-headed. So I'm not their mom, and I try not to act like their mom. I just t- show them, like, there's stuff that's different out there. Mm-hmm. With adults, they already know. They already know what right from wrong, and they know why they in there and why, what can they change or whatever. So basically what I, I work in the recreation department. Basically what we do is we put on programs for the inmates. I work for the feds, so we have a lot of funding, even right. though we're on government shutdown, but hey, that's another story. <laughs> right. <But> we, have, <laughs> we have more funding than the state. So we put on like wellness classes, uh, nutrition classes. We uh, do national NFPT, National Federation of uh, Personal Trainers. We we test them so maybe when they get out, they could be a personal trainer. Um, we bring people in to talk to them about jobs uh, and sports, personal training and everything like that. So with, with me, um, I really, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not the type of coworker that go to an inmate and try to change their life. They come to me because I put a lot of programs on. Okay. So they ask questions, hey, hey, Ms. Roberson, you think woo, 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 this and that? Because I don't be in inmate space. Because as a woman, you have to run. You have to. You have to move different in a prison. Because mm-hmm. once you start talking to them, giving them conversations, they want to know your personal business. So basically, what I do, if they want, if I put out the information, they come to me. Then that's when I tell them about programs that hire fel- felons and everything like that. Because most of them don't have hope outside of the prison. They don't have family. They don't have anything. They don't know what they're gonna do. And basically, I help them with that as far as them wellness part. Um, you feel good about yourself when mm-hmm. you lose weight, you eat and write and stuff like that. So I put on a lot of programs for them, uh, give them nutrition guides. I mean, just help them with their wealth. Okay. You know, uh, it's hard to be wealthy when you're in a prison, but that's all they do is work out, you know. So 
some of them get depressed and I just we just put on sporting events like for Black History Month we do programs for them like all types of stuff for them Hispanic Week we do Hispanic Week it's it's just a lot of stuff that they can do in there that people don't realize music programs and everything okay Keeping, I guess, keeping in tune with uh, you wanting to, you know, have positive change inside the system. Um, does your book, A Sister's Revenge, does that, is that kind of like a step up in doing that? And also, where do you want to take your, because you have an amazing message and an amazing story with this. Do you, where do you hope to take this entire deal, um, I guess, in the future? Where do you want to take it? You know what? Um, back at home, it's a lot of violence going on. It's a lot of violence everywhere. Mm-hmm. But where I'm from, I know uh, I lost my cousin through gun violence. I lost my uncle, and I lost my childhood friend, which all three of those people I talk about in my book. Mm-hmm. And every day I see on Facebook RIP, every week, every month, something about RIP, something, and it has something to do with gun violence. So basically what I want to do with this book is do a Stop the, uh, stop the Violence rally, um, Something for my community. I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to go back to my high school okay. and pay for their shoes for basketball because I never got the chance. Like, I had somebody pay for my shoes because I, they wanted me to play so bad, and I couldn't never get the team shoes. So somebody always, my coach used to always help me pay for my shoes because my mom couldn't do it. I always wanted to do something like that. Oh, that's um, amazing. Eventually, with this book money, I want to um, give out scholarships for people that have lost their parents through gun violence. Okay. Um, like my friend uh, that passed away, she has like three or four girls and eventually when they grow up, I want I want them to have some type of scholarship money if they go to college. So that's my plan to do a scholarship fund. I want to, like I said, I want to name it a Mark Thomas scholarship fund or something like that. So for mm-hmm. kids that lost their parents um, through gun violence or something like that. So I always want to do something with my community, but I just never... I haven't been home to live in years, so I always go to visit, so I just never can do anything, but this book is going to help me go travel, speak my word, and eventually I want to uh, team up with Trayvon's Martin mom, because I talked about him in the book, Okay. Um, and he reminds me a lot of my brother, So, and they're from Florida, so uh, that's a similarity with that, but team up with her, and I want her to hear my story, and Okay, man, that's that's awesome. I I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, now, one last question for you: um, When does the book come out, and then how can people order it? I know it's up for pre-order. How can people order it and then pre-order it as well? Okay, so here's the deal: I'm on the contract, so I really can't say when the book comes out, okay. but it's gonna come out soon after the holidays because you know I'm doing my interior design right now, so I'm almost done. I'm done with the content and everything like that. Okay. But uh, pre-orders are on sale right now. You can buy that uh, A Sister's Revenge book. That's all in one word. A, sis- a Sister's Revenge book dot com. Okay. You can pre-order it from there. Okay. And so, how how I'm, much is? I'm, the... I'm, oh, my bad. Go ahead. That? I'm looking. I I, don't, I can't say a date, so I don't really know. But very, like within the month or so, I, I think it should be coming out. So. Okay. And how how much is the pre-order just for for my frugal 20. people out there? <laughs> $20. Oh, $20. Oh. See, yeah. See, I think I think it will be more when cuz my um, publisher just asked me about the Am- his, in the Amazon account. So I think it's going to be more on Amazon, so I'm not sure. So Okay. Get your pre-orders now. So it's $20 at first come first serve. So when I um uh, when I do my pre-orders, uh whoever gets the pre-orders, they're going to get their books first. So that's why I'm doing my pre-orders so I order the books and give them out to the people that already ordered them. Okay, man, twenty dollars even I can afford that. So you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, sir. hey, well, I, I appreciate you joining me on the Undrafted Podcast. You have anything else you want to add? No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So this is Andrea Roberson, author of A Sister's Revenge book coming soon. Get your pre-orders now, first come, first serve. So that way, when the book does come out, you wanted the first ones to get it. And twenty dollars, you can't beat that. Uh, well, yes, sir. Well, I appreciate you, Andrea, for joining me on this podcast, and uh, you know, I wish the best for you and your family. Appreciate you, man. Absolutely. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. I want to say thank you again to Miss Andrea Roberson for joining me on the Undrafted Podcast. Go get that book. Pre-order your copy of A Sister's Revenge today. That book is going to be a great book, and this is just the beginning of some great, great things for that young lady. Now it's time for The Low with Row.
The Steelers and the Saints, they slugged it out in a thriller on Sunday. The Saints edged out the Steelers 31-28 in a game that was not for the faint of heart. Cam Jordan, he gave the Steelers some bulletin board material with his remarks about Ben Roethlisberger not being a Hall of Fame quarterback. Big Ben, he did his best to discredit that narrative by going 33 of 50 in passing, 380 yards, three touchdowns, and zero interceptions. With the loss, though, the Steelers, their playoff hopes are very, very slim. And with them needing a lot of help from the Browns to get in this weekend against the Ravens, I'm not sure Pittsburgh makes the playoffs. Now, on the other side, the Saints, they locked up the number one seed in the NFC with a bye week and home field advantage through the playoffs. Now, I'm not a fan of either one of these teams, and this game had me on the edge of my seat. Well, let me kind of rephrase that because I love Drew Brees. Like, Drew Brees is my guy. And since the Broncos are bull jiving and they're out of the playoffs, the Saints, they're my stepchild team this year only and only because of number nine. Now, coming into this game, my main question was, what would the Saints look like? Because the last few weeks, they've been struggling, and they looked like a team who had kind of just lost their way. You know, they were having trouble through the air anytime teams took away their main receiving target in Michael Thomas. Drew Brees, he seemed like he had been struggling, and it was well noted that the Saints were struggling to pull out these wins on the road. Now, at the beginning of the season, they looked like they were a team that was going to steamroll through the rest of the NFL on their way to the Super Bowl, and then they had the debacle in Dallas, and that really kind of seemed to bring them back to earth because they hadn't been the same team since that game. But on Sunday, the New Orleans Saints backed up what I said last week on this podcast. The New Orleans Saints are the best team in the NFL, at least right now, and they proved it by beating one of the best squads in the NFL. Now, before I go any further, let me just say that this is one of those crazy years in the NFL where there's no clear-cut favorite right now. I say New Orleans is the best team. They're at the cream of the crop. They're like at the top, the crown of your head. And everybody else is like at the temple. Like it's so close and it's so crazy how close all of these teams are at this juncture of the season. Drew Brees was 27 of 39 for 326 yards and a touchdown on Sunday. And he did a really good job of spreading the ball around and finding other guys when Michael Thomas wasn't an option. Now, Michael Thomas, he finished with 11 catches for 109 yards and a touchdown. So he still did his thing. It's just that they got more guys involved like Ted Ginn. Ted Ginn had a few really big catches in that game. Now, a lot of people said that the Steelers got robbed or a lot of people said or tried to say that the Steelers got robbed in this game. I personally don't think the Steelers got robbed. Now, there were some terrible calls by the referees in this game, uh, like that pass interference on Alvin Kamara on that fourth down where they were down, um, where that basically put the Saints uh, at the goal line. I think that was early in the game when that happened. That was a terrible call. But, you know, at the end of the day, man, refs, they blow calls in every game. Every NFL game, every college game, every high school game, every high school game, it happens. Refs blow calls. But in this particular game, even though there were a few blown calls or a few bad calls by refs, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they had every opportunity to win this game. And like the coaches used to tell us in school, you never leave the game in the hands of the officials. Don't let the officials affect the outcome of the game. And Pittsburgh, they had, a, they had plenty of opportunities to take the game by control. They just didn't execute enough to get the win. I mean, I could think of a few plays where Pittsburgh basically threw the game away. There was the fourth and five, that fake punt, where they didn't execute there. There was the third and 19 or the third and 20, where they had the, uh, the Steelers' defense let Ted Ginn make that big catch and convert on a first down. That's two plays right there. Then you had Juju Smith-Schuster, of course, who fumbled the ball on the very last play for the Steelers at the end of the game that gave the game to the Saints. So that's three plays right there where the Pittsburgh Steelers, they could have took the game by control and they could have put their foot on New Orleans' throats. Now, the Saints' offense, they look better than they had the last few weeks, but they still struggled early on in the game to get it going against the Steelers' In what looks like to be a revamped defense uh, for Pittsburgh. Now, New Orleans caught on fire in the fourth quarter when they put the drive together that led to the go-ahead touchdown. But they really didn't get the running game going early. And that's really 
what had them sputtering for most of the game. Now, the Steelers, they looked like they were headed in the wrong direction on defense before the New England game last week. And then it looked like they kind of just started to turn a corner. And even in, even coming into this game, the Steelers' defense looked really, really good. Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram were held to 58 yards on 18 carries. What? One of the most dynamic rushing attacks in the league was held to a paltry 58 yards this late in the season? How'd that work? Drew Brees, he's the best pure passer the NFL has ever seen, and he'll have all the records by the time he hangs his cleats up. But the Saints, they have to find better balance on offense going into the playoffs or it's going to be even harder for them to reach the promised land of being Super Bowl champions. Now, the Saints, I think they're ranked 11th in offense, 11th in uh, rushing, so it's not like they're that far off, but they need to get a little bit better. They need to get a little more balance on their offense or they might find themselves at home early like they did last season. So, with that being said, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of numbers and stats, but if you look at when the Saints are at their best, it's when they run the ball as well as they pass it. It's no coincidence that the Saints average 54 rushing yards in their two losses compared to 133 yards in their 13 wins. But enough about the Saints offense. I got to give it up for this Saints defense, man. Cam Jordan, he made headlines last week when he said Big Ben wasn't a top five quarterback of this era and he isn't a Hall of Fame quarterback in his opinion. Now, while I disagree that Big Ben Roethlisberger isn't a Hall of Famer, because he is, I don't disagree about him not being a top five quarterback of this era. Because the cats in front of him, in no particular order, you got Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Phillip Rivers, and depending on who you ask, if you throw Super Bowls and all that other stuff into the equation, some people might even try to put Eli in front of Big Ben Roethlisberger and take Phillip Rivers out of the top five. So it gets kind of tricky with these kind of discussions. That's why I really don't get into them because there's so many different variables. But enough about that. This is the second week in a row in which the Saints defense, they locked down when they needed to and they sealed the deal. They tend to bend, but they don't break a lot of the time. The Steelers, they got the ball back with uh, with a minute 25 left on the clock. After Michael Thomas, he scored an acrobatic touchdown uh, touchdown late in the fourth that originally the ref said that, you know, he caught it, but it was like at the one-yard line. Then they did the whole touchdown review, and then they called it a touchdown, all that good stuff, yada, yada, yada. Now, all Pittsburgh had to do at this point was kick a field goal to tie it, or, of course, they could have drove down the field and got the touchdown to take the W. And they were driving the ball well as they had basically done all game. You know, Big Ben, he had possibly his best game of the season and definitely one of the best games of his career on Sunday. So when the Steelers got the ball back that late, I was like, bruh, you know what? If the Saints don't stop the Steelers here, there's a really good chance that the Saints are going to lose this game because with the weapons that the Steelers have, Antonio Brown, Juju, uh, James Conner, Stevon Ridley, I think James Conner was hurt for this game, and, of course, Ben Roethlisberger, Vance McDonald and Jesse James at tight end, that's really not a squad you want to go to overtime with. So Big Ben, he passes to Juju Smith-Schuster, and Juju was popped between two Saints defenders, and he fumbled the ball. So, of course, that closed the game for the Saints right there and basically ended the Steelers' season. Now, the Saints' defense, they did the same thing last Monday night against Carolina when the Panthers, they were down by three with a minute 44 to go, and they forced a turnover on downs. For the Steelers, though, turnovers have been a bugaboo for them because it's killed them in at least two games this season. They lost the game in Denver because of turnovers. They lost the game on Sunday because of turnovers. Those two losses alone will keep Pittsburgh at home come playoff time. But one thing is for sure. The road to the Super Bowl in the NFC is going to go through New Orleans, and this Saints squad, they play out of their minds in front of that home squad. And honestly, with the Super Bowl being in Atlanta this year, there's a really good chance that if the Saints make it there, it's going to be like a home game for them anyway. Now, if they get the offense balanced out a little bit more and get it back to where it was before that Dallas game, the New Orleans Saints, they're going to be a hard squad to beat come playoff time. Now we're going to move on to I'm in and I'm out. The Denver Broncos. Uh, Man, this squad. I love the Broncos, but man, (laughs) boy, they just, they love to abuse me. I'm out on this season for the Broncos. The Broncos, they took on the Raiders on Monday night, and this game was 
It was straight up embarrassing. There's just no other way to put it. The Raiders beat the Broncos 27-14 in what could possibly be the last game at the Oakland Coliseum. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this game or talking about the Broncos in general today. That's how upset I am about this season. Now, y'all know my feelings on this coaching staff. I really don't have too much of an issue with most of the players on the Broncos squad because the Broncos have a lot of talented guys on their roster. It's the coaching staff that I have the biggest problem with. Now, I'm over this coaching staff, and I'm ready for significant changes to be made. The Broncos played so bad Monday night, the team playing should have left everybody in Oakland. Now, with this loss on Monday night, it ends the Broncos' 46-year streak of not having back-to-back -back losing seasons. The last time the Broncos did this was 1972. I wasn't even thought of back then. My parents hadn't even met back then, man. Like, that's how long it's been. Thank you, Vance Joseph and staff. That particular statistic, that particular streak, that was all we had going for us after this year, after y'all bull jived and wasted away yet another season, and y'all couldn't even get that right. The Broncos have one more home game left in this trash of a season, and they may as well give Vaughn and the rest of the vets the day off and let the young guys play and just evaluate them for the future. And before anybody says anything about, you know, the Broncos need to lose for draft picks and all and draft position and all that, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm sorry. I, I just, I've never been a fan that bought into the whole let's tank to get a better draft position and this and that and the other because that's just dumb to me. Why would, I mean, these players work extremely hard to get where they're at. They work extremely hard to be the best at their craft. Why in the world would these dudes lift all this weight, r do all this running, eating all this food, and, you know, trying to get their body right and keep their body right, doing all these treatments and stuff and massages and everything else through the week? Why would they do all that only to go out and lose a game on purpose just to help a team get a better position in the draft to select a player that you don't even know if it's gonna, is going to pan out for your squad in the future? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and that, that really gets that, may, that gets on my nerves when I hear people say a team needs to lose for better draft position. I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's idiotic to me. The Broncos were shut out 17-0 in the first half. Now, this first half included a 99-yard punt return for a touchdown when the Broncos couldn't down the ball at the one-yard line, a 12-men-on-the-field penalty on the defense, a two-for-eight performance on third down from the offense, and a delay-of-game penalty on offense on a fourth-and-one call when the Broncos were moving the ball pretty well down the field. The Broncos, they committed 11 penalties total, two turnovers. Now, a lot of that boils down to coaching, and that falls squarely on the shoulders of Vance Joseph. The Broncos' offense, they were on the field for 17 minutes and 43 seconds in the first half. They punted six times. All that time in the first half, they never made it inside the red zone. Out of all that time and all those possessions, not one time did they score a touchdown or even kick a field goal. 11 total drives in the game for the Broncos, and they only scored 14 points. And then we go to the defense. Joe Woods, man, the defensive coordinator, I have no idea what this dude is thinking. They drafted Bradley Chubb with the number five pick in this year's draft to be a pass rusher, which means his primary job is to rush the quarterback. And yet and still, Joe Woods has the bright idea to drop this dude in coverage a big part of the game and a big part of the season. And to speak about how good of an athlete Bradley Chubb is, even with his coaches consistently putting him out of position, he has 12 sacks on the season. And as far as bright spots, I mean, it's been all doom and gloom so far, uh, talking about the Broncos in this game, because that's really all it was Monday night. Phillip Lindsay was the lone bright spot on Monday. Now, he hit the 1,000-yard mark. Uh, I think it was like on a 14-yard run um, for the, you know against the Raiders. But he's just the third undrafted rookie to do that in NFL history and the sixth Broncos rookie running back to do so. But even then, it came out on Tuesday – that Philip Lindsay, he fractured his wrist in this game, so he's out for the rest of the season. And that Pro Bowl, which he was just voted to, there's a really good chance he doesn't play in it. So as far as the coaching staff, big changes are coming to the coaching staff in Denver after the Chargers game on Sunday. But, you know, the thing is, with the, coaching, with the ownership situation being tied up in court like it is, that makes it, you know, it, it's really unstable at the very top 
of the chain in Denver. The quarterback situation, it's still not settled. Case Keenum has been bad this year. There's just no other way to put it. Case Keenum has been a disappointment. Now, he put together a nice stretch in there where he went like seven or eight games without throwing a pick. But outside of that, Case Keenum's been pretty disappointing at the quarterback spot this season. For how he's played, Denver would have done better just keeping Trevor Simeon because at least at this point, they would have got basically the same production, but they would have saved themselves $25 million. So when you think about it, the ownership situation um, is kind of shaky. The quarterback situation is shaky. Denver's got a few holes on offense and defense um, that they need to get taken care of. So when you think about all of that, it really kind of looks like it might be kind of hard for Denver to lure a top-notch coaching candidate to come to the squad in 2019. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done, but Denver, they've got their work cut out for them. John Elway, I don't envy you at all, man, because you got some serious work to do in that Broncos front office. Now we move on to what is becoming my favorite segment on this podcast. What's the wave with Chef Road Daddy? Now I talk about sports a lot on this podcast. This is a sports-based podcast. But, you know, as a guy who participated in sports all through school, part of playing sports and part of being active and all that is basically living better and being more mindful of what we're putting inside our bodies because that has a huge effect on what goes on on the outside of our bodies. So often we hear about how we should cut carbs and cut sugar and things and all this stuff from our diets, and we hear how bad or excess carbs turn in the sugar when our body breaks them down. And if you're like me, this means you have to keep your consumption of carb-rich foods like pasta, bread, and potatoes to a minimum all of which I just happen to love. So what is a man or woman to do in trying to be more carb conscious to keep the pounds down? Now, experts tell us to eat things like fruit, sandwich wraps with no bread or flat bread, energy bars, protein bars. They say all eat eat all this kinds of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But are foods like that actually worth it? And do they actually work? Many times the answer is a resounding and surprising No. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to list some surprising foods that actually have more carbs than a bowl of pasta and how it can affect your body. Now, I'm just going to tell you, prepare to be shocked and or heartbroken. All right, so let's get it. First up, mango. Now, this one hurt me because I love fruit and I love mangoes. One mango has 50 grams of carbs per fruit. But don't despair. When it comes to mango, and if you're a mango lover, just eat a few slices per serving and you'll be fine. Now, if you're trying to go low carb, watch your portions and slicing size especially because portion control is everything. Now, no matter what diet you're doing, keto diet, low carb, South Beach, um, intermittent fasting and all this other, there's so many diets out there. But, you know, to be honest with you, A lot of the diets that's coming out nowadays, it seems like they're basically just a remixed version of the Atkins diet, which is, you know, basically low protein or or excuse me, which is basically low carb or no carb type of deal. They just put in put another spin on it uh, or put another little lifestyle change on it and they just put another name on it. But no matter what diet or lifestyle change you're on, portion control is key. Now, the good thing with mangoes are just half of one mango has an entire day's worth of vitamin C, which helps keep those cortisol spikes down. Now, what are cortisol spikes? Cortisol spikes are those pesky things that store fat in our bodies. Now, when it comes to fat, fat is nothing more than excess energy that's been stored in your body. It's energy that your body just hadn't burned off, which is why it's so important If you're trying to lose weight or trying to change your lifestyle, that's why it's so important to get up and exercise at least 30 to 45 minutes a day. And then to be honest with you, if you're getting up and you're exercising, uh, just to give you a tip, one pound of fat contains 3,500 calories. So if you're keeping your calorie count low, you know, around, you know, 1,800, 2,000 calories, whatever you're doing, if you go to the gym four or five days out of the week, and you burn an additional five to 600 calories per day, let's say you burn 500 calories per workout and you go to the gym five days a week. That's 2,500 calories 
that you've burned just from working out. Now, that's not even counting the calories that your body burns up going throughout the day and everything else. So if you burn that extra 2,500 calories plus the calories that your body burns up by you, you know, eating better and just by your body just you know, using calories for energy throughout the day, you can easily burn one pound of fat per week. So I just wanted to throw that little tip out there, just kind of give you another aspect about this whole fat burning thing that we hear so much about now. Anyway, getting back to the mango, if you're on a low carb diet or meal plan, you want to watch your fruit consumption as a whole. Keep it to two or three small servings of fruit a day because fruit has natural sugars and carbs in it and those can add up fast if you eat too much of it. Now, natural sugar is better for your body than refined sugar, true enough. It's better for your body than refined sugar or sugar that's in candy and soda, but too much of anything is a bad thing and too much natural sugar can actually backfire on you and slow down your progress. So, like I said, going back to portion control, portion control is everything. The next food up, french fries. Now this particular food right here, this is not that big of a surprise. We all know french fries are not that good for us. Now, I talked about these a few weeks back when I talked about that Harvard professor who had the audacity to tell us that we should only eat six fries per serving. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> now, when it comes to french fries, they have 63 grams of carbs per serving, which is twice the amount of carbs in an average bowl of pasta. Now, this article where I got all this from, off of Yahoo Health, a serving of french fries was a small order of fries. And I don't know too many people who go to a burger place and get a small order of fries. I know I don't, which is why I stay away from them. Now, it's no need to go into too much detail as to why fries are so carby and starchy, because that's a given. But fries and other foods that are cooked in vegetable oil, they contain high levels of inflammation-causing compounds that form when certain foods are cooked at high temperatures. Now, why is that important? Inflammation plays a huge role in obesity and being overweight, as well as many of the aches and pains that tends to ail some of our bodies. The next surprising carb-rich food, and this one was a shocker, raisins. What? Yes, raisins. Raisins have 34 grams of carbs per one and a half ounce box. Now, these little fellas, they're sweet and chewy, so watch your intake of them, because especially if you eat them in oatmeal, because oatmeal, while, they're, while oatmeal has good carbs, oatmeal has enough carbs in and of itself. These 34 grams of carbs in that small box of raisins is slightly more than a cup of penne pasta, which is crazy. I never would have, I never would have guessed that. The next carby food on the list, bagels. Now, this one isn't a big surprise, but bagels are extremely carby and starchy. One medium-sized bagel can have 55 grams of carbs with 277 calories and a very small amount of fiber. Now, with all that bread and all those calories, this will make your blood sugar take off like a jet. And since bagels have very little fiber, you're more likely to crave more carbs during the day. Why is that? Because when you eat something that's full of carbs and very little to no fiber, it's like eating pure sugar. And we know the addictive qualities that comes with eating sugar. And that's exactly why you crave more of it. Now, the next one, and this one is going to hit a lot of people in the chest because it hit me in the chest when I read it because I love them. Muffins. Those sweet, sugary mounds of breaded heaven. Muffins. One large blueberry muffin has 74 grams of carbs, which is almost as much as six slices of wheat bread. That's all in one serving. They're also loaded with a bunch of fat and calories, 520 calories and almost a third of the allotted fat grams for one day. And if you've done like I used to, and I've done this plenty of times, so I, I know the deal, you would eat half now, half later to try to break up all that guilt. Now you probably tried this like I did and you found it nearly impossible to do this because, and I know because I did it. That second half of that muffin, when it came to me, Rochelle Hamilton Jr., that second half of that muffin didn't last five minutes before I smashed it. Now, I would try to talk myself, and, oh, man, you know, I'll just eat it a little bit later, and then, you know, I mean, you know my body would be done broke down, this part of it, and then I'll eat it a little bit later. Nah, bro, I'm going to kill this. I'm going to kill this second half of this muffin because, man, this bad boy, it's like an angel dancing on my tongue. Anyway, why is it so hard to do that approach? Because foods rich in carbs, fat, and sugar are extremely addicting. And that little trio, carbs, fat, sugar, 
That little trio sets off triggers in our brains, which keeps us craving for more. And when it comes to these cravings and when it comes to how they affect your brain, man, I don't have time to go into it. But whenever you get a chance, Google some of the research and the studies of the effects of sugar on the brain. And there have been uh, several studies and several sources of research where it actually shows that when sugar hits the tongue and it's released into the body, that there are chemicals, there are chemical reactions that go on inside our brains that are identical to a druggy getting a hit. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to be funny. That is actual scientific research. So like I say, I don't have time to get into it, but Google it. Whenever you get a chance, look it up. It is amazing the effects that sugar has on the human body and the human brain. Now, that's all the foods I'm going to get into as far as this particular episode goes. Now, there are some more surprising carb-rich foods that I'm going to get into next week. That's it for part one of this little mini-series, and I call it a little mini-series because there's about 15 different foods that I'm going to discuss. So this little, I guess, discussion <laughs> is going to stretch for about another week or two. And again, let me let me reinforce this. Like I said last week, I'm not saying you have to be super restrictive when it comes to food like this. I'm not saying you just absolutely can't have it. You know, don't do that because that mindset actually works against you. What I am saying, though, is just we have to change our approach to food and we have to change our approach to portions and things like that. Because a lot of it is the portion size. That's a big part of it. The portion size of the things that we eat and also the frequency in which we eat it. So say like the muffin that I talked about, because I love muffins and that's why I got to be as big as I as big as I was. I don't eat muffins like I used to, but I still love muffins. So let's take like a muffin. Now, with the muffin, the one thing you could do instead of eating the entire muffin, just eat half of it. And when I, and I talked about the half now, half later approach, that other half, either throw it away or give it to somebody who will eat it immediately. Now, the re now, I know our parents always told us not to waste food and everything else, and I get that. But with me, I'm one of those people I have to take it to extreme measures to get where I'm trying to go because I know me and some of my weaknesses. And that's another thing. That's another thing that's very important when you're trying to change your lifestyle, when you're trying to do right. You have to know what your weaknesses and your triggers are, and you have to plan accordingly for them. So, you know, with like a muffin. If you say, like, you know what, I'm only going to eat a half or a quarter of this muffin and that's it, well, the, the part of the muffin that you don't eat, either throw it out or give it to somebody else who will eat it immediately. The same with a bagel or anything else. Start shrinking your portion sizes, and it, it's all about changing the approach. It's about changing your mind because when you change your mind about food and portion sizes and what you're going to eat and what you're going to put inside your body – once you start to change that from a mental aspect, the body's going to follow. And we've heard that saying since we were kids, where the mind goes, the body follows. And that is so true. It's even been proven in people that got sick, you know, with like terminal diseases and everything else. They, there's scientific uh, research that shows when that person is feeling, you know, good about themselves and everything is going good. They tend their bodies tend to feel a little bit better. And but when their spirit gets down, when their mentality gets down or they're feeling down, they start thinking down the body follows. So trust me, once you start changing your mind and your approach to food and portion sizes and the kinds of things that you're putting inside your body, the, the, your body's going to react. And, and trust me, I, know, I can tell you from experience, once I changed my approach and once I changed up what I eat and the frequency and the portion size and everything else that I ate, I used to do cheat days. Like when I first started this little journey, year and a half, two years ago, I used to do cheat days like where I would eat good for like two or three weeks and then I would have a full blown day where I ate whatever I wanted to eat. And I'll be honest with you, that is one of the worst things that you can do. Don't because, man, I'll tell you, man, when I did those cheat days, when I got up to go to the gym, it took me about two or three days of feeling sluggish in the gym before I felt like myself again. And that's how I could tell some change was going on. So now instead of doing the whole cheat day aspect I just do one cheat meal where I'll eat the way I normally eat the majority of the day. And then I, then I'll eventually have, you know, like a hamburger and some fries, not six fries. I'll just have like the full order of fries. But I have like a hamburger and some fries or some pizza or, you know, some carb rich sandwich, you know, whatever I'm craving for. And then once once I once that meal's done, I'm right back at it. Now, I might have like, you know, a cookie or two as far as like my dessert, but I'm right back at it. So that's just one tip. 
that I use to really kind of stay on track. And also, you know, a lot, I know a lot of time this time of year, a lot of us, we don't have a lot, we don't have a lot of time to cook and things like that. You can plan ahead, plan accordingly. So if you're going to like Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A has a salad selection that's really, really good. You can check those out and get the grilled chicken instead of the breaded chicken. That'll save you a lot of calories and a lot of carbs. If you go to somewhere like Chipotle, um, you could get like a chicken bowl and just get a bunch of vegetables with it. Very little cheese. And as far as the rice and the beans, don't get any. Or if you do get some, put it on the side. Have them put it in the, the little side cup. That way you can put your own uh, preference on it. You don't have to put so much. Because you know how Chipotle does, man. They'll try to fill up that whole bowl with rice and beans and then give you like two pieces of chicken and a bunch of vegetables and then try to charge you like 10 or $11. So you got to watch those people at Chipotle because they think they slick. But, but yeah, I, I, I'm just, I say all that to say this. It's not about being super restrictive and everything else and putting handcuffs on your body and your stomach. No, enjoy the food. You just have to change your approach in which you enjoy it. So just be more mindful of what we eat. And I say this, I say this, we, because I'm on the same journey that I'm telling you all about now. I'm really just starting to get more comfortable with telling y'all about my weight struggles and everything else because um, that was a big reason why I didn't do a lot of it at first because I wasn't that comfortable. Even though I told God when I started this podcast that I would use this podcast as a way to use my struggles with weight and food and everything else to be an inspiration to other people. And now that I'm doing that, man, I love that. I love it. I absolutely love it. So again, what we put inside our bodies shows up on the outside of our bodies. Our outward appearance is a direct reflection of what's on the inside. So that saying you are what you eat is truly a 100% true saying. Like I say this all the time, we can beat this y'all. We just got to put our minds to it. And for the last topic on episode 35 of the Undrafted Podcast, this is some bull jive. Cleveland Browns quarterback Baker Mayfield made headlines on Sunday after he stared his former coach Hugh Jackson down on a short pass that turned into a big 66-yard play by Browns tight end David Njoku. Now, the play basically ended the game, but the stare down of Jackson is what has everybody talking. Now, I like Baker Mayfield a lot. He could potentially be the best quarterback of this draft class, but I'm tired of this dude's pettiness and his antics. Now, he says he's dissing Hugh because he went to play for a division or he went to work for a division rival, but I don't buy that at all. That sounds like a cop out to me. I honestly think Baker Mayfield is still upset that Hugh Jackson didn't play him from the jump and then he made the big announcement to him on hard knocks that he would be the number two quarterback in training camp. And I, I think Baker was embarrassed by that or whatever, but bruh. Grow up, man. I mean, that's life. Things are not going to always go our way. We won't always get what we want when we want it. That's part of life. Rejection and all that stuff, it's part of life. It's part of being an adult. And in this case, it's part of being a professional athlete. And as a professional athlete, you will hit a lot more adversity than just being the number two guy before your career is up. You can believe that. This dude has gone out of his way to be petty and disrespectful to a man who doesn't even work for the Browns anymore. That's pride and ego on full display. And like the Bible says, pride goeth before the fall. Now he said last month he didn't like how Hugh went to a division rival. Man, kill that noise. This man was fired, which means he's free to work for whoever he wants to work for. There's no loyalty in professional sports. You get the best opportunity you can, when you can, and while you can, while it's still on the table. And then there are folks in the media, they're celebrating this right now, and I'm sure he's laughing at it and kicking it up right now. But to see that what he doesn't realize is the minute he does something people don't like or that they think is stupid, these same people in the media who are laughing with him now will be the first to tear him down and laugh at him when things go left. See, the crazy thing is he had a really good game on Sunday, and the Cleveland Browns, they've won five out of their last six games with him being the quarterback on the roster. And he's had a really good season since Hugh Jackson was fired. But see, this is what happens when you act out like this. We talk more about the antics than we do the performance. Baker Mayfield, let it go. This is petty. This is lame. This is that bull jive. Well, that's my time for episode 35 of the Undrafted Podcast. I want to take this time out and thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for blessing me with the gifts, the talents, and the resources to do this podcast. I want to say a special thanks to Miss Andrea Roberson for taking time out to do the interview uh, with me on the podcast. Again, 
Go pre-order her book, A Sister's Revenge. It'll be out soon. She's got an amazing story, an amazing message. So I want to send all my well wishes and prayers out to her and wish her my best. Thank you again, Andrea. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to tune in uh, on the Undrafted Podcast. Don't forget, you can follow the Undrafted Podcast on Instagram and on Twitter at Row for Show Pro. And since we're at the tail end of the holiday season, I'm going to share one of my favorite Bible verses with you, and I'm pretty sure most of you know it. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Remember, do your best and let God handle the rest. Be blessed.